Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started today. I wanted to thank you all for joining us for another exciting webinar. This one's entitled Photoacoustics Beyond the Abdomen, Dentistry, Drug Monitoring and Cell Tracking, tracking being presented by Dr. Jesse Jokerst. My name is Christina Asa from Fujifilm Visual Sonics, and I'll be moderating today's session. Today with me, I also have Drew Heinmiller, who's our product manager for our laser photoacoustic systems. He'll be here to the end of the session to answer any product specific uh, questions you might have. Just a couple of housekeeping notes about today's webinar. A recording will be made of the webinar, including the questions session, and we'll distribute that afterwards to anyone who has registered. It will also be available on our website. All lines will be muted for the duration of the web webinar, so please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions you might have. Questions will be answered at the end of the session, and we expect the presentation to be about 20, 45 minutes, leaving us 10 to 15 minutes for some questions. At this point, I would like to introduce our speaker for today, Jesse Jokerst. Jesse V. Jokerst is an ass assistant professor in the Department of Nanoengineering at UC San Diego. Dr. Jokerst graduated cum laude from Truman State University in Kirksville, Missouri in 2003 with a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry and completed a PhD in Chemistry at the University of Texas at Austin in 2009 with John T. McDe McDevitt. Jesse was a postdoc with Sam Gambier at Stanford Radiology from 2009 to 2013 and was an instructor in that same department from 2013 to 2015. At Stanford, Jesse received a prestigious American Cancer Society postdoctoral fellowship, a Burroughs Welcome Collaborative Research Training Grant, and an NIH R25 postdoctoral fellowship. Jesse started at UCSD in July of 2015 and his research focuses on novel chemical probes as acoustic contrast agents. He is currently funded under the NIH's K99 R00 pathway to independence and new innovator awards. Without further ado, I'd like to pass things over to Jesse for a very exciting presentation. So uh, thanks again for the introduction. Um, my name is Jesse Jokerst. I'm on the faculty at UCSD in the Department of Nanoengineering. So we're a relatively new department um, but we recently had our 10 year anniversary. Diverse group of faculty focusing on everything from energy storage to photovoltaics to drug delivery, but all with an emphasis on nano. So my work um, uses uh, nanoparticle contrast agents for uh, primarily ultrasound and photoacoustic imaging. So I've been in working pretty closely with photoacoustics now for about six years and um, it's been exciting to explore some of these different applications. And so what I wanted to do today is talk about sort of three case studies that um, are kind of unconventional uses of photoacoustics, one in, in dentistry, um, another one in therapeutic drug monitoring, and then a final application in cell tracking. So uh, first we'll talk a little bit about the introduction, the photoacoustic technique, and then some of these additional examples. So I got excited primarily uh, in ultrasound and photoacoustics because of this figure. Um, what I like about ultrasound was just the really fast temporal resolution. So some of the techniques I was using before ultrasound, I could create a frame every one hour, maybe every 20 minutes. But with ultrasound, I could create hundreds of frames per second. I had video frame rate. And so that's what we're plotting here on the x-axis is the temporal resolution. And then on the y-axis, we're plotting the spatial resolution. And ultrasound, uh, in ultrasound, the spatial resolution scales as a function of frequency, but it's routine to have um, hundreds of microns of resolution using this technique. So, so ultrasound, again, offers good spatial resolution, good temporal resolution. Um, it's also broadly applicable. There's a number of different applications. When I talk about ultrasound to a lay community, they typically tend to think of obstetrics and monitoring pregnancy, but of course it's broadly used in cardiology, a variety of orthopedic applications. Uh, the primary limitations of ultrasound is that it's low contrast. So it's difficult to speak, see a specific targeted region above the background. It's also primarily an anatomic technique. So we're looking at 
structures rather than function. That is relatively little molecular imaging. And it's also difficult to do multiplexing with ultrasound. So that is, can we see multiple different channels at the same time? Um, a red, green, and blue, for example. So we're looking at multiple streams of information. Um, and so what is exciting about photoacoustics is that it starts to solve some of these uh, limitations by combining um, acoustics and optics. So here's an example of a traditional ultrasound image. This is a, a ovarian cancer mass. And if I draw in these arrows, and if you're a trained radiologist, you can probably identify this as being a mass. But I think it really nicely illustrates the low contrast. That is the specific signal from the target area over signal from the background um, that ultrasound suffers. So one technique that has a lot of contrast is optical imaging. So here I have a laser pointer, and so I'm shining this laser pointer through a beaker of water, and you can see this very bright spot where the laser pointer hits a paper towel. Okay, so a lot of signal versus the surrounding region. The problem, of course, with optics is that it's very easily scattered. So here I've put a drop of yogurt in this beaker of water, and then on the far right, I put three drops of yogurt. And you can see very clearly how these, these photons are both absorbed and scattered. And so it really quickly limits the ability to use optics in systems that have lots of yogurt in them or um, our bodies. Basically, our bodies are full of uh, fats and proteins that will um, absorb and scatter light. So what photoacoustics does is it combines the contrast of optics with the resolution of ultrasound. And the, the mechanism in regular ultrasound, it's sound in, and then there's an echo off the sample and sound back to the transducer. In photoacoustics, it's light in and sound out. And so this was originally described actually by Alexander Graham Bell over 100 years ago, but it hasn't been until the last oh, 15 years or so that the uh, transducers have been sensitive enough and the lasers have been short enough that we can use this for um, imaging in, in living tissue. So the mechanism is that the incident light, the incident photons are absorbed by the target. And um, this target then has a very spatially confined temperature increase. And that temperature increase creates a pressure wave due to thermal expansion. And then these pressure waves illustrated here by these dashed lines are detected by um, ultrasonic transducers and then formed to create uh, an image. What's important here on the, on the left hand side, you can see that many of these photons have been scattered and they're no longer coherent like the incident laser beam. And that's very important because we don't have to have coherent photons. All the photons have to do is be absorbed by the tissue. They can have been scattered many different times. And then the, the spatial resolution of the image is, is due to the, the absorption and not the, uh, the coherent uh, illumination of the target. So we start to have high contrast with photoacoustics. Again, we still have high spatial and temporal resolution. Multiplexing, so this is important because now we can start to excite at 650, 750, 850, 950, and we start to have different colors, if you will, of ultrasound. So by differential color channels within our, um, within our image, and I'll show some examples that illustrate that later. It can also be very specific uh, depending on the absorber and quite versatile with a number of different applications. So some of the limitations, it's still difficult to uh, get acoustic data through through bones, so uh, deep brain imaging can be difficult in people. Also, we still have to couple. So, um, for example, the lungs can be difficult to image because we need to have um, some kind of coupling media between the transducer and the target tissue. This is not going to be deep, deep tissue. We're going to be several centimeters deeper than traditional optical imaging, but um, this is still using light, so we still have a, a number of uh, uh, surface weighted considerations. Um, but that's, that's not that big of a problem considering the large number of medical applications that are on uh, the first three to five centimeters of the human body. Okay, so hopefully that's clear, um, the mechanism. So now we can start to dive into a few applications. Uh, the first one is in dentistry. And so I don't know how many of you have, have had this done. I have this done about every six to eight months. 
And the dentist, the, essentially the question they're asking is how healthy is the gingiva? How healthy are your gum tissues and how firmly are they attached to the tooth? So if you have very healthy gingiva, the gum is very firmly attached to the tooth, okay? If you start to become, if, you're, if, you're, if your gums, your gingiva start to become inflamed, they detach. This is called clinical attachment loss, and there's, there's less, um, less support for the tooth by the gingiva. And this makes sense as, as time goes on and people really don't take care of their teeth, the teeth eventually fall out, right? So what a metric of, of assessing how healthy your teeth are is known as the pocket depth measurement. So your, your dentist or his technician or her technician will take this metal probe and insert it between the tooth and the gum and literally see how far down they can poke it. It is a technique that was established at the turn of the last century and really hasn't changed much since then. So they measure how many millimeters into this pocket can this little probe be inserted. And so they'll, they'll uh, be poking and reading off numbers like three, three, four, five, two, five, and that's how many millimeters at each, at each point. So you can imagine that there are a number of limitations to this technique. First of all, what is the force that this little metal probe is being forced into the mouth, right? This is a very difficult um, metric, the force to hold consistent. Also the insertion point, where along the gum line is this being inserted? The probe angulation, is this at a perfect 90 degrees? Is it at 80 degrees? Is it 45 degrees? The patient's health status that day, do they have any gingival inflammation? Are the patients hydrated? So there's a huge amount of variation um, in this metric as a, as a tool to assess gingival health, up to 40% when two different technicians uh, evaluate the exact same patient. Of course, there's also a number of patient considerations, right? This is a painful, very invasive procedure. Many patients have bleeding after they've been probed. So the last time I had this done, it just occurred to me that there has to be a better way and um, you know, maybe imaging can help. Of course, dentists use x-rays. Um, x-rays are good for, for assessing harder tissues like bones and tooth, but it, of course, ultrasound is very good at assessing soft tissue. So our long-term vision is that the subject would rinse their mouth with some sort of um, some sort of contrast agent, some kind of food grade contrast agent, and then insert this mouthpiece shaped transducer that we're in the process of building and that this would beam it essentially these pocket depths back to the chart. So this would be a completely non-invasive procedure and uh, would be very, very quick and hopefully more reliable than the gold standard approach. So what is this food grade contrast agent? Well, there's a number of things you could imagine, but for this first application, I wanted to use something that I knew would be easy to translate to people. And so we used this food grade uh, squid ink or cuttlefish ink. So this is used in a lot of cuisines from uh, Japan, other parts of the Pacific Rim, also many parts of the Mediterranean. Italians will put this in pasta. So this is a, a food, we bought this at a, at a specialty grocery store. And it, it comes from these cuttlefish, these, these mollusks that emit this ink to avoid predators. And I didn't know this until I started this project, but that the ink that squid and cuttlefish emit to avoid predators is actually full of these melanin nanoparticles. And so nature has created this to be the, the dark material in the squid ink. And it's just simply these very, uh, very beautiful melanin nanoparticles that the, that the mollusk creates. So um, there's the size, we characterize the size of these are about 150 nano, nanometers. And then we looked at the photoacoustic spectrum of them. We looked at two different brands and, and noticed relatively broad absorption across the infrared region. So then we could look at the different uh, photoacoustic signal. And so here on the left is a sample with uh, 10 to 1% uh, melanin nanoparticles in buffer. So I'm gonna show images like this quite a bit. Um, the black and white is the regular ultrasound, so just sound in, sound out. And then the red pixels are the photoacoustic data. Okay, so we've overlaid 
the photoacoustic data on top of the ultrasound data. So the samples are placed in these capillary tubes. Hopefully you can appreciate that this is a little capillary tube. And so as the signal goes up, uh, the concentration goes up, the signal goes up. So if you see images like, like this in the rest of the, the presentation, that's how these were created. Um, these were created by taking the transducer and sweeping it across in a three-dimensional approach across the sample. So this is essentially a series of uh, individual scans that have been summed to make what's known as a maximum intensity projection. Okay. We also looked at the effect of pH. The mouth can have some very uh, diverse pH effects, but these pH effects do not affect the signal intensity of the melanin nanoparticles, so that was important. So now we took a swine model, and this is a sagittal view of a swine tooth. So here, hopefully you can appreciate this is the underlying bone. This is the gingival uh, tissue, the gum, and then here is the bone, the, or excuse me, the tooth that's coming out, out, of, the, um, out of the jaw. So we um, rinsed the swine's mouth with this uh, squid ink contrast agent and then did a scan. And so we noticed both signal that's specific to our contrast agent as well as some residual stains. So these swine actually didn't do a very good job of brushing their teeth. They actually had very poor dental health. So this was a good example of how we could use spectral photoacoustic imaging to start to deconvolute the difference between our contrast agent and the background stain. So here the red curve is the photoacoustic spectrum of the contrast agent circled here, and the blue curve is the photoacoustic spectrum of the residual stain, the background staining. Um, this is just the plaque and the tartar that's on the pig's teeth. So then we could color code this in a smarter way and color code the, the contrast agent in red and the background staining in blue. And so when we look then at a frontal view rather than a sagittal view, I think you'll appreciate it even nicer that in black and white, we have the just regular ultrasound data. So you can see really obviously the swine's teeth. You can see the blue color, which is the residual staining. And then in green, I've drawn in the gingival margin. So this is before any of the oral rents. And then after the oral rents, you can appreciate both the background staining and then the pocket is very clearly illustrated. And what's great about this is we can start to understand the contour of the entire pocket. For example, if we were doing a single point measurement and went here, we might think that it's a very deep pocket. If we imaged or probed here, we would think it would be a very narrow pocket. But what imaging offers is the ability to understand the contour of the entire pocket. And uh, talking to some dental colleagues, this really could have profound significance on how patients are treated. So this was a, a paper that was published last year um, and was actually got picked up by the BBC, the PBS NewsHour. It was, it, was, it was pretty fun. So we could go on then and uh, look at the pocket depths at different locations. D is distal, L is lingual, um, and M is mesial. We could look at shallow, intermediate, and deep pockets. And so here on the far right, we're corresponding the probing depth measured with the gold standard. So that's actually discrete variables, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six millimeters. And then on the y-axis is the probing depth by photoacoustic imaging. And so um, when we first sent this into peer review, they said this is all well and good, but you don't have very many deep pockets and pigs just don't have very deep pockets. So we created some artificially deep pockets using a scalpel. And so that's what these black squares represent are artificially created pockets that are deeper. And then the red dots are the natural pockets. Regardless, if you look at the data, you know, the artificial and the natural pockets, or if you look at them combined, we see good correlation between the technique measured by imaging versus the gold standard. So we also showed this again for lingual and buccal locations, distal locations, all of these locations were confirmed. We could then do what's known as bland Altman analysis. So this is a technique to look for bias. And we showed that the bias values were less than 0.2 millimeters um, for, for all of these locations. So, you know, somewhere between two and 10%, depending on the depth of the pocket, but well within the standard of, um, 
well within the accepted convention because again, the, the gold standard technique has an error of up to 40%. So we have done some clinical translation. My IRB on this was actually approved within 90 days. It's perhaps the fastest IRB <laughs> um, in the history of this university. And the advantage again was that we were using um, non-invasive ultrasound and um, this uh, squid ink contrast agent. Um, and so this is some uh, clinical data that we've collected using these, uh, using this approach. And so here is teeth 7, 8, 9, 10, and then 22 through 27. And so you can appreciate that at these different um, frequencies, we start to have better spatial resolution. So spatial resolution increases with, with frequency. Um, and then we could also go on and start to apply the squid ink. And so this is with, um, with heavy water rinsing. If after we've applied the ink and the subject really rinses their mouth heavily, a lot of the ink is gone. With light rinsing, there's some residual ink on the teeth. Of course, I should note that with a simple tooth brushing, all of this ink is very clearly removed. But regardless, we can use the background anatomy of the ultrasound data to really start to clearly illustrate the pocket. So this is work that's ongoing, um, but it was exciting to see that some of these initial trials, at least with um, four or five human subjects, um, are, are recreating what we're seeing in the swine. So we could look at reproducibility data. Um, this is just uh, five different replicates at mesial, distal, and then either a lingual or buccal location. And we're seeing very, relatively limited variation um, across these different replicates. So future work, you could imagine um, a number of different applications, especially with smarter uh, contrast agents to maybe start to identify plaque, subgingival plaque, molecular imaging of biofilms. There's also a lot of work in cosmetic dentistry that uh, we could imagine is being applied to. So the second application is for therapeutic drug monitoring. And this is work by <coughs> Taeho Kim in my lab. He's a postdoc. And uh, so completely different topic. What we're working on here is a new way to treat anti uh, to treat bacterial infections. So one way that people have treated bacterial infections is with silver. So silver is a, a very well-established antibiotic. It destabilizes the ribosomes. It increases membrane permeability. It's also um, effective against both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. Um, one limitation of silver is that it's difficult to give in a controlled and smart way. So what Teho proposed is that we can take gold nano rods that have a very strong photoacoustic signal, deposit a layer of silver on top, which would essentially stop the photoacoustic signal, which I'll show why here in a second. But then as this silver becomes oxidized, the silver metal becomes silver ions, which are very antibacterial, and then we have a photoacoustic signal that returns. So this is, a, this is advantageous because we're a, we can measure the silver concentration in vivo, and it's impossible to do this with any other technique. <clears throat> so um, the gold nanorods were built with, with established techniques, and then the silver was reduced onto the surface using ascorbic acid. So you can see this very obvious morphology change, um, where it goes from this more rod-like, cylinder-like shape into a more spherical shape. And what happens when that, when that happens, the absorption moves from the infrared region. So the purple curve here is just the as prepared gold nanorods. And then the green, gray, and orange curves are thicker shells. So the green curve here is about a three nanometer layer of silver. The orange curve is about a 10 nanometer layer of silver. So as more and more silver is plated on the surface of the gold, the absorption moves deeper into the blue, farther, farther from um, our excitation line, which is around 720. So if we are exciting here, the purple curve would produce a lot of photoacoustic signal, but these other curves would not produce much signal because they don't absorb very much at 720. Um, so how do we release this silver? Well, we could, we could use an exogenous um, sort of 
um, activator. So this was uh, ferrocyanide, which is a, a, a well-established activator. It has a, um, a reduction potential very close to that of silver. Um, but the reduction potential is not strong enough that it's going to cause gold to come off. So the gold is was unaffected by this activator, but the silver will be quenched because the standard reduction potential is closer. So here is just showing just that. So these are silver coated gold nanorods. We add in the activator and then we release the silver and the photoacoustic signal comes back. So the absorption spectra here, red is before, blue is coated, and red is after. And the photoacoustic signal shows just what you would expect. Here these again are these capillary tubes, the gold nanorods. When we add in the silver on top, the signal goes away, and then when it's etched, it returns. So this is very important because we're showing that this photoacoustic signal then correlates with the dose of silver. So we're not just imaging, you know, we're, we're truly imaging the concentration of silver that's being released in this sample. So then we could start to look at um, how do these free silver ions affect bacteria. So we've looked at this with both MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, and also um, Escherichia coli, E. coli. And we looked at first the effect of free silver ions, um, and free silver ions were, were quite effective. Uh, we looked at the effect of the activator or the etchant, and that had no effect, the ferrocyanide. When we etched out our gold nanorods, this was very effective in killing the bacteria, but the unactivated gold-silver hybrids had little effect, very similar to no treatment. So the x-axis here is CFU, that stands for colony forming units. It's sort of a metric of how many bacteria there are. And so um, hopefully you can appreciate that these silver ions, when released from the gold nanorods, are very effective. Um, at killing bacteria. You might say, well, why not just use free silver? Well, you know, that's, that's an option, but any kind of clinical translation is very limited in the ability to inject free silver or isolate free silver at a wound site. So we could then go on and look at uh, both MRSA and E. coli and show that values between 10 and 50 micromolar of silver uh, were very effective at killing three log orders of bacteria, so 99.9% of the bacteria. We also did a small animal study where we inoculated uh, mice with either MRSA or E. coli, and then one day later treated them with the, the gold hybrid and the activator that was injected IP, um, and then monitored this, the size of this wound for six days and then collected tissue with histology. So here are some photographs. Hopefully you can appreciate that on day one, all of these mice have an infection. And that in the absence of treatment, this infection gets bigger and bigger and bigger over time. But when we treat this wound with this gold-silver hybrid and then activate it by IP injection of the activator, this wound um, gets smaller over time, certainly does not get bigger. So that is the black curve here. So you can see this wound size getting smaller. In the absence of treatment, of course, this wound gets bigger and bigger and bigger. One thing that was interesting when we did this is how much effect there was just by using the gold-silver hybrid in the absence of an activator. And so this was statistically significant, and we hypothesized that actually the re reactive oxygen species present in the wound that were activating and causing the silver to be released. So we looked at some reactive oxygen species. So here hydrogen peroxide, here peroxynitrate, and we could show very clearly that both hydrogen peroxide and peroxynitrate were very effective at um, activating these particles, causing the photoacoustic signal to come on. And then we could also do this study where we correlated the photoacoustic intensity versus the concentration of silver release. So this is very exciting and kind of where this, I see this work going when we think about using the endogenous reactive oxygen species that are produced by the wound to activate this particle and then in turn produce a photoacoustic signal. We could uh, look at 
the, the wound that was treated and untreated. And so in the untreated example, you can see this really dysregulated uh, dermal morphology. And then in the treated animal, the, both the dermis and the epidermis is nicely uh, retained in a normal, normal morphology. So here's just again another TEM image showing that hydrogen peroxide has enough reducing power to move from our silver coated rods back to the original gold morphology. So I think future work in this area is going to continue correlating this natively produced ROS, this endogenously produced reactive oxygen species to the silver concentration. Um, we're, we're getting at least three log orders of killing and I'm imagining moving this into a more kind of bandage like design where the ROS is uh, released from the wound and then the silver from the nanoparticles in the dressing is released back into the wound. And then this whole process can be monitored then by acoustic uh, data. So the last example is on stem cell tracking. And so this is a project, this is perhaps the most established area of research in my lab. Um, so this was the topic of my, my first NIH grant, which is now wrapping up, was using acoustic data to answer basic questions about stem cell biology. So there have been, at this point, thousands of people who have received therapeutic stem cells. And you can imagine a number of different questions that come up when people get these cells, such as where are the cells located? How many are there? Are they alive? Are they dead? Are they interacting with the surrounding tissue? So these are all questions that imaging is ideally suited to answer. Sort of the gold standard in this space is magnetic resonance imaging. And magnetic resonance imaging is very powerful. It offers a great penetration through tissue, has good soft tissue contrast. Uh, but one limitation is it's low temporal resolution. It's essentially like taking a snapshot, whereas ultrasound is like watching a video. So this is especially important when one is monitoring the delivery event of the stem cells. And so a lot of the work in my lab has combined ultrasound and MRI to combine the advantages of each for real-time, low-cost, instantaneous imaging of the stem cells with ultrasound and then long-term follow-up with MRI. So, um, you know, I'm happy to, to, to send other examples of this. Um, but this is the most recent example that we've published. Um, this was published in ACS Nano, also by uh, Teho Kim. And so what Teho did was create these Prussian blue nanoparticles. And so Prussian blue is actually one of the oldest um, materials in inorganic chemistry. Um, it's, it's sold as radiogars. This is a different kind of insoluble capsule uh, and used clinically but what Teho did was build these very beautiful cuboidal-like structures um, that combine um, iron in this interesting cuboidal-like format. And so what's, what's exciting is the really intense infrared absorption that these materials have. So we, the, we get this cuboidal structure that has a delocal, well not a delocalized, a broadly distributed negative charge from the sodium citrate that was used in the synthesis and then we could encapsulate it with poly -L lysine to both stabilize the charge and encourage these particles to go into the cells. So we could monitor the size and we see a slight size increase here on the red curve when the materials are coated with poly -L lysine. That makes sense that their hydrodynamic radius increases, but there is no increase in the, um, the absorption Oh, and, and no shift in the absorption. So we still have a nice peak around 700 nanometers, which is right in the heart of the optical window. So uh, we could then use these particles to label human mesenchymal stem cells. So on the left is cells that have been labeled with the particles. So you see this obvious blue color. Here are control particles incubated with cells and very little uptake. So this is the importance of using this poly -L lysine uh, because of the charge-based affinity to uh, transfect these cells. So this was all done ex vivo. So we label the cells ex vivo, then collect the cells, and then proceed to inject. 
Um, here we, we could show where with a little more detail in the cytoplasm, the cells, or excuse me, the particles are located. The blue is the nuclei and then the green are the particles. And then this is electron microscopy that shows very obviously this uh, cuboidal-like structure of these particles inside of the cell. Um, we could go on and study how does the photoacoustic intensity change as a function of labeling concentrations. So, you know, this is a key, key set of experiments in any of these cell labeling um, papers where you first want to optimize the concentration of the contrast agent, the incubation time of the contrast agent. And it makes sense that there's more signal if there's more particles in the cell. This was just corresponding, or excuse me, showing that the photoacoustic signal corresponds to the amount of iron that is loaded inside of the cell. Um, this is data showing that the pluripotency of the stem cells is retained. So um, you can imagine if these strange particles are being loaded inside of the mesenchymal stem cells, what effect does that have on their biology? So here we took cells that were labeled with particles as well as control cells, and then it directed them towards a fat-like lineage, so a dipogenic lineage or a bone-like lineage, osteocytes. And so both the labeled and the unlabeled cells could both move in towards this, these two different uh, lineages. We could look at the migration, and again, both cells that are labeled and unlabeled um, can migrate into this region where cells have been removed. So this is important. You're seeing that they're not only migrating, they're also proliferating, so we're getting more cells over time. And then we could start to do some uh, in vivo imaging. So this was just a very simple experiment to understand detection limits in vivo. So this is a subcutaneous injection. Here's ultrasound mode on the left and photoacoustic mode on the right. And you can see this inclusion of cells that has been injected. But if we use 400,000 unlabeled cells, there's no increase in photoacoustic signal, but this very obvious increase in signal when the particles are labeled with the Prussian blue nanoparticles. And then this is, um, this data demonstrates our ability to quantitate cells. So here we're plotting the photoacoustic signal as a function of the number of injected cells and show that we can detect down to 200 cells per microliter, which is, well below uh, what is used in most clinical trials. Most clinical trials, of course, use up to 10 hundred million cells per patient. Uh, this was a study to look at longitudinal cell tracking. So here we implanted 50,000 cells on day one and then tracked this out to day 14. So this, I think, really speaks to the strength of particle in uh, longitudinal tracking. This can be very, very difficult, especially as the cells proliferate. With every generation of cells, there's a dilution of the contrast. And so if a cell had a thousand particles, when that divides into two daughter cells, each cell only has 500 particles. So um, it's important to have a very intense photoacoustic contrast agent to make sure that that signal is retained over time. And then this was a demonstration showing that we could image through intact skulls. So, you know, I mentioned earlier that it can be difficult to do acoustic imaging through the human skull, but this was an example where we're imaging through a murine skull. And um, on the left are unlabeled cells, on the right are cells that are labeled with the particles. Um, the first panel is baseline. The middle panel we've injected, or excuse me, um, placed the needle through the skull into the animal's brain, and the last panel is after injection and the needle's removed. So you can see in B mode, you can see in ultrasound the trauma that results from the injection, but on the right-hand side, we very clearly are seeing the cells, and that's impossible if they're not labeled. So this is, is key detail that's going to discriminate the trauma from the injection from the background photoacoustic signal. So I think future work in this area is going to combine endogenous and exogenous approaches. So one of the limitations of using these nanoparticle reporters is they're not truly telling us is the cell alive or dead, right? This particle is going to be producing signal regardless of whether the cell is viable or not. So that's one of the strengths of a lot of the uh, reporter genes uh, technology. So I think approaches that combine the advantages of reporter genes and exogenous labels will be uh, increasingly attractive. 
Uh, we've also done a number of studies where we're using traditional ultrasound rather than photoacoustics for, for monitoring cells. We've also done a couple studies where we're using these particles as a theranostic agent. So the particle doesn't only report the presence of the stem cell, it also releases a growth factor that helps keep the cells alive. These cells are inherently being placed in a very uh, necrotic and fibrotic part of the body. So it, anything we can do to increase cell viability is, is very valuable. We could also imagine imaging things like tumor-associated macrophages, CAR T cells, et cetera. Um, you know, we've also done some ocular imaging in the lab. This is a paper we recently reported that we were imaging the retina and imaging intraocular pressure using photoacoustics. Um, we're also moving increasingly towards um, alternative excitation approaches. So this is a, a system that uses LEDs for excitation. Um, and if you can imagine some of these more, uh, like the, this mouthpiece design, for the dental application, we would need some smaller hardware. And so this is, I think, an area where we'll continue to focus. So with that, again, I wanna thank my entire group. Um, this is um, from last summer. We haven't done our summer 2018 picture yet. There's Tejo who did um, a lot of this, the work that I talked about today. Octavia did the initial dental work. Um, and then that's been picked up by Coleman and Yuting. Um, I'd also, of course, like to thank uh, Visual Sonics for all the help over the years. I think when I was a postdoc at Stanford, we got either the very first or the very second laser system that rolled off the line. And so that was really instrumental in getting my career off the ground. And then, of course, we've been very, very happy with the scanner here at UC San Diego. Uh, I'd also like to thank my funding sources, uh, primarily the NIH, uh, the R00, which is ending this year, but then the DP2. Um, which is for therapeutic drug monitoring of heparin, which I, I didn't talk about today, which is another major thrust in my lab where we're building these kinds of uh, smart catheters that monitor the amounts of anticoagulants that are present in a patient's uh, vein using, using photoacoustic imaging. So with that, um, I'm happy to um, answer any questions. You can find my lab website via Google. Um, I'm always interested in uh, talented students and postdocs, particularly those that come with funding, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Jesse, for such an interesting and diverse presentation. Uh, so I would like to encourage everyone to submit their questions in the Q&A panel on the bottom of your screen. Um, you can do that any time now as we uh, start with the first ones that came in. So here's the first question for you, Jesse. There has been studies to measure oxygen, oxygen saturation in blood. What is your opinion on using it for measuring O2 saturation in head trauma patients? Um, yeah, I mean, I think photoacoustics has been used not just in blood, but really in, in tissue. Um, I, I think it's going to be dependent on the the subject. I'm, I'm reluctant to try to use photoacoustics for deep brain imaging as it's currently designed. And it's just a matter of getting enough light through the skull and sound out of the skull. Um, but I think there could be really interesting studies um, using animal models um, that, could, that could use photoacoustics. Um, and I think there's also a number of other applications besides the brain where it's important to quantitate oxygen saturation that this technique would also be suitable for. Great. Thanks, Jesse. It's, uh, it's Drew here. I just wanted to f kind of a follow-up question to that, and maybe a more general question, since a lot of your presentation uh, does deal with, you know, translational research, looking to move a lot of this technology into the clinic. Considering, you know, some of the limitations of, of really uh, being able to get the light uh, deep enough to, to generate signal there. Um, can you just comment generally where you, sort of where you're going or where you see the clinical side of things going with photoacoustics? Yeah. Well, you know, in the absence of, except for this cell tracking application, I'm working on the surface of the body. I'm, I'm really not even doing anything on cancer these days. I've got a, a few maybe small projects in cancer, but this dental application, um, 
is I only have to get light through five millimeters of tissue. For this bandage application, I only have to get light through, really, I don't even have to get light through any tissue. Uh, for this heparin project that I briefly talked about, we're just imaging a catheter that's placed inside the vein. So I have to go through maybe three millimeters of tissue. Um, that's what I'm focusing on. I'm, I'm not trying to fight it anymore because um, there's, there's a lot of people who are working on deep tissue imaging, maybe with different designs of transducers. But I think there's enough applications where, uh, enough interesting applications on the surface uh, to keep at least me busy for quite a while. I also think we all should keep an eye on this, uh, the notion of wearable technologies. I think uh, if, if you look at, at what's been done already on wearables, there's a tremendous amount of potential, but most of those signals use either optical data or electrical data. And I think uh, the ability to incorporate acoustic data into wearable technologies is a real, uh, I, I think the community may be missing out on an opportunity to contribute um, to that space. So that's another area. And so do you call this mouthpiece a wearable? Eh, maybe, maybe not. Is this bandage a wearable? Mm, maybe, maybe not. But that, that concept of using acoustic data in devices that, that you know, sit on the surface of the patient or the, or the human is where I'm really focusing rather than trying to attack, you know, organs that are deep in the human body. Great, thank you so much for that. Uh, so kind of along the same lines, um, and this is specific to your, the wound project, but could be taken into other uh, areas, would you find it valuable to look at other parameters within a wound to monitor something like treatment efficacy using photoacoustics, for example, looking at uh, SO2 levels? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you could imagine, you could imagine pulse oximetry, um, other contrast agents that are looking at free radical concentration. Um, if you, if we had targeted contrast agents that look at um, maybe the type of bacteria that's in the wound, I also think the ability to image, you know, just with basic ultrasound parameters, um, such as Doppler, I think would potentially have a lot of value. Um, you could also think about um, imaging lipids. I think as, as Visual Sonics and other companies release these scanners that are capable of imaging in the second near IR window, the ability to start to look at lipids and lipid uh, formation, lipid quantitation using that second near IR window. Uh, would have value not only in, in wounds, but in other, in other situations. Thank you. So another question that came in, uh, started complimenting you on a great presentation and asks, uh, when the contrast agents get into the mouth, how deep can those nanoparticles go and uh, how can that depth be improved? That's a good question. So, you know, with the swine, we essentially pipetted it on the gingival margin. Um, and in humans, we've both, we've both done that where we've pipetted it on the gingival margin. We've had the subject swish their mouth, kind of like a mouth mouthwash and rinse that through the, on the gingival margin. Um, we've also used it kind of like a gel. The right answer, I don't know. Um, I think that by changing the viscosity, by changing uh, maybe the other excipients that's in the, this oral rinse, we'll be able to get deeper into the pocket. Um, you know, thus far, we don't seem to have a problem of going to the bottom of the pocket. Um, but you can also imagine how fast does the subject rinse their mouth, at what speed. So I actually have a grant that's going to be reviewed tomorrow or Friday, so um, big fingers crossed for that because that would provide funds to, um, to answer some of those basic questions about how can we get this, what, what is the right protocol to, to get this uh, contrast agent into the pocket. Thanks, so just a, a bit of a follow up from that. Do you think uh, w with the high resolution ultrasound, do you think you even need the dye or what additionally does the photoacoustics add that uh, 
the ultrasound doesn't give you? Oh yeah, I mean, I don't know if my screen is still saved, but if you look at, um, so on the swine, it's really obvious that without the, without the contrast, both in the, the frontal view and here in the sagittal, um, it's very difficult to understand how much of the, how, where the pocket actually ends. And so I think that trying to do this with, with just pure B mode ultrasound is gonna be very difficult because you have so much backscatter that comes off of the tooth, right? The tooth, the, the interface between the tooth and the soft tissue has a tremendous amount of acoustic impedance. And so that's super bright when you would just do a pulse echo experiment. So I think to try to do that without photoacoustics would be, would be challenging. Um, there's a number of other things you could look at with just ultrasound, but to try to, to do the pocket depth, I think would be a challenge. Yeah, I was just thinking, Jesse, um, you know, things like, you know, inflammation of the gums from, you know, some kind of gingivitis or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And um, hypoxia. You know, one of the questions I get on this is, well, why don't you see signal from the gingiva, right? Because the gingiva is, is highly perfused tissue, right? There's a lot of blood. And the answer yeah. is because the gain, this, the signal from these particles is so high that we have the gain turned down really low. So we've definitely imaged the, the, um, the, hydro, the if, we, if we've done this with a rabbit where you put the rabbit on low oxygen and you see the the perfusion and the oxygenation and the gingiva go down and then you put them on oxygen it comes back up so yeah i think there's a ton of applications i mean the, the challenge is building this thing right yeah, yeah. A major engineering challenge which i'm sure you can appreciate drew um and so we're really limited to some of the at least in humans we're limited to just those teeth that are on the front of the mouth um but but if this project achieves funding, I think there's a, a ton of things that we could do once we have this built in terms of imaging, just even in the absence of a contrast agent, looking at inflammation um, that may not be obvious by visual inspection. Yeah, yeah. Oh, neat. So uh, along those same vein, uh, along that same vein, uh, do, you, do you see any application for using this same kind of technology or this same kind of setup for measuring any inflammation or gum disease? Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's totally uh, a, a, a utility for this approach. Um, I think that that's an unmet need. Of course, it's easy for a dentist to see if there's inflammation just by visual inspection. But what's challenging is looking at regions below the gum line or in, in the back of the mouth or maybe in the, in the root of the tooth and where that inflammation might not be obvious by eye. Hi there. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Jesse. That was a great presentation and really appreciate the variety of different applications and also the translational aspect of things, which, um, which, you know, we have a lot of different customers doing work, work like this and publishing. Um, and I like this sort of translational uh, slant that you've taken here. Uh, in, in, a, in a bunch of different areas. So that, that was really great, really interesting. Um, I just want to give a couple of slides here, a bit of a plug. Um, I think Jesse's work was done mostly on the system on the left that you see there. That, that's the Vivo Laser. Um, we do have a new system that we launched last year, the Vivo Laser X, which is on the right. Um, uh, many of the advantages are, of the new system are, you know, we always co-register our, as you saw in Jesse's um, uh, slides there, we always co-register our B-mode images with our photoacoustic images so that we have um, anatomical um, information along with the functional information that, that you get with uh, photoacoustics. Some of the main advantages of the new system uh, are really about the, the workflow and, and uh, acquisition of images, the ease of acquisition. There's a customizable um, touch screen. Um, we also have a new laser technology that we're using with the new system, which is uh, faster, more sensitive acquisition where you've got higher energies. And we have, uh, as Jesse mentioned, an expanded wavelength range. Um, so we go from 680 to 970, uh, but we also have the additional range of 1200 to 2000 nanometers um, to look at things like uh, lipids and that kind of thing. Um, we also deliver the light in a little bit of a different way. 
Um, and something that might allow, uh, you know, somebody like Jesse who is playing around with different configurations, uh, it allows you to actually uh, use the light in a, basically decouples the light from the transducer itself so that you can do illumination in several different ways um, and really optimize the illumination to the particular application that you're, uh, that you're going for. Um, We've also got a variety of uh, hardware and software tools. For example, things like uh, an injector pump, which uh, the interface for which is integrated into the system itself. We've got Phantom and an application, uh, software application designed around that for doing some of the things uh, like Jesse, Jesse showed, like the uh, you know imaging different concentrations and different formulations of photoacoustic contrast agents. Um, Jesse, I like that you showed the, the brain images as well, because um, with this higher energy, we're actually able to see, you know, right into the brain of a mouse non-invasively, right, right through the whole thing. So we've developed this uh, anatomical atlas to go along with that and um, uh, stereotactic positioning system as well. Um, really, this allows, you know, a variety of different applications, uh, you know, from, from something whole body, which I'll talk about in a second, to really narrow small areas looking at different kinds of contrast agents. I mentioned the brain, so there's uh, applications like stroke, molecular imaging, Jesse, uh, you know, talked a lot about that using different photoacoustic contrast agents, and then just using the inherent contrast of blood to look at things like hypoxia in, in tumors and uh, ischemic disease. And really, you know, a major advantage that I think we offer is really going, especially on the molecular side, going from something that you might see in an optical system, um, going a little deeper and looking with high resolution at, you know, more than one uh, chromophore and also having information about, you know, volumetric information, uh, anatomical information, and then functional information like blood flow and uh, oxygen saturation. Just the last thing I want to mention here um, is a whole body imaging setup. We actually presented this last year at WMIC meeting uh, where we're actually acquiring these whole body images to do things like uh, biodistribution of different contrast agents. Uh, it, it's, it's a new thing. We actually just held a workshop here in Toronto uh, just last week where we were demonstrating this um, uh, this new uh, hardware that we're showing and, and potentially opening up some some new applications with that as well. So just wanted to give a really quick uh, overview of, of some of those things. Um, finally, you know, if you have any questions for us, please do visit us at our website, www.visualsonics.com. Uh, you can submit questions or request uh, information. Uh, via the website there um, and please check out as well uh, our past webinars so we save all these webinars we record them uh, we post them on our website so that you can go in and view them afterwards of course we're all uh, on all the, the, the major uh, social media channels um, and you can visit us at conferences we will be at WMIC uh, this year in September uh, which is in uh, Seattle this year so we will be there as well as usual, if you have any questions about our products or technology, please contact us at the, at the links below. All right. Thank you very much, Drew. So at this time, we're going to sign off, and I want to thank Jesse very much for your really interesting presentation. I also want to thank all of you for signing on today. Again, you'll be receiving a uh, recording of this webinar. And uh, again, please keep in touch, and we'll be posting our next webinar soon on our website. Thank you, and have a great day.